Hello, it's Talk Gnosis. It's a show about Gnosticism, esotericism, religion, and whatever I'm interested in this week and how I can somehow tie it into Gnosticism. We've got a strong tie this week. We're talking about the heresy of Jacob Frank from Jewish Messianism to esoteric myth with Jay Michelson. Hello, Jay Michelson. Pleasure to be here. This is fun. You know, Oh, great. Yeah, we were having a great discussion beforehand, and, uh, you know, I had to cut it off because we, we don't want that. we got to save some sizzle for the actual show. And uh, people criticize me because I never do bios. I want to get straight into it. But there's a good chance a lot of our listeners or watchers are going to know who you are from your journalism, from your uh, uh, work on mindfulness. And if you don't know who he is, then uh, go to jmichelson.net. Also, get this book, because chances are, you're, if you're listening and watching to the, the show, you're, you're going to love it as much as I did. Can I so, really hawk it? Right there, we please. go. I'm showing it up for those who are watching on video. There's the cover. <laughs> yeah, the heresy of Jacob Frank from Jewish Messianic. I can't even say the word Messianism to esoteric myth. We'll also link it in the show notes. So, as I always like to do, we'll we'll dive right in. And as I always like to do, ask an enormous question at the top of the show that, that I hope that you can answer in in a couple of minutes. But can you give us the elevator speech of who Jacob Frank was? Sure. So uh, we'll back up 100 years before Jacob Frank to kind of set a little context. Uh, in the middle of the 17th century, the largest messianic movement in Judaism arose in the 1660s around a figure called Shabtai Tzvi. Uh, it's estimated that between a quarter and one third of European Jews may have actually believed that Shabtai Tzvi was the Messiah uh, in 1666. And while that, they weren't all necessarily the deepest true believers, that still was or really rocked the Jewish establishment. It undermined rabbinic authority and it transformed Judaism. Uh, as the movement grew, the Ottoman Sultan took notice of Shabtai Tzvi and gave him the choice to convert or die. And Shabtai Tzvi chose to convert uh, to Islam, uh, thus ending his mass movement uh, as a Jewish messiah. But the movement did not totally disappear. Uh, and for the next hundred years uh, in particular, there were kind of two main uh, ways in which it continued. Some uh, of his followers actually also converted to Islam and became kind of outwardly Muslim, but secretly Messianic Jew Jewish. These were known as the Dernma, uh, the turncoats. So it's not necessarily a term of, uh, of a complimentary term. Uh, and this movement actually lasted through the 20th century, which I find completely fascinating that there was this kind of open secret that these, uh, these, this group of Muslims were actually um, sort of not Muslim at the same time. In the Jewish community, which is where we'll focus uh, the beginning of the Jacob Frank story, there were a number of believers in Shabtai Tzvi who kind of went underground after the apostasy, but continued their messianic belief. And really for until Jacob Frank, a hundred years later, this community, this kind of subterranean belief in the, in the Messiah was semi-tolerated, occasionally persecuted, but mostly just kind of ran as an undercurrent uh, in European Jewry, mostly in Ashkenazic Europe and in kind of Northern Europe. Uh, and uh, we'll focus in on, on Poland in particular. Um, until Jacob Frank, who entered the scene uh, in the 1750s, in the beginning, he went to Salonika, who, which was the kind of headquarters of the Sabbatean movement, then returned to Poland and became one of many uh, kind of charismatic leaders uh, at the time. But uh, in 1757, his sect was either discovered or alleged uh, to have been engaged in a, in a sexual ritual uh, that was may or may not have actually happened, but it almost doesn't matter because it became a gigantic scandal. Uh, and the sect was reported by the rabbis to the Catholic Church uh, as, a her as a heretical movement. This violated Jewish law, it violated precedent for hundreds of years, but nonetheless, the sense among the rabbinic establishment was this was a bridge too far and the semi-toleration of these heretics had to come to an end, and so it did. There were numerous twists and turns over those couple of years. The Frank, Frank fled back to, uh, to the Ottoman Empire. His sect then collaborated with the church, colluded in anti-Semitic campaigns, very dark period. Uh, but then kind of the fortunes flipped a little bit. Uh, and in fact, that the, there was a new church leader in charge uh, of this whole investigation. The Frankist sect and Frank himself were given the choice once again to convert or die. Uh, and in 1759, the largest mass apostasy in Jewish history took place. Uh, it's unknown exactly, but probably a couple of thousand people converted en masse uh, to Catholicism. This was obviously, again, a remarkably traumatic event uh, that was infamous, and the whole sect was, was infamous. 
there again, the kind of mass movement or the mass interest in Jacob Frank kind of ends, but the movement also does not die. Um, Frank is, Frank's conversion is seen to be insincere accurately, and he's actually thrown in prison for 12 years uh, until in 1772 when an invading Russian army kind of liberates where he, uh, where he was held. Uh, he then has a whole other career. Uh, which is the focus of my book and the and the kind of the oral teachings of his that were recorded mostly in the year 1784. These teachings were often regarded as kind of garbage by scholars, like he had nothing really to say. This guy was a con man, kind of a 18th century cult leader, to use an anachronism. Um, but I try to show in my book that actually, while he was certainly a devious and manipulative and often violent uh, individuals, no paragon of virtue, he also developed this remarkable theology, uh, bringing together a kind of almost liberal or rationalistic critique of religious law. Religious law doesn't work. You shouldn't listen to it. It's garbage. It's holding you back from flourishing and so forth with a whole esoteric myth uh, a kind of Gnostic esotericism that the whole world is the enemy of the true God, as Frank says at one point. Uh, and the goal is to, by gaining esoteric gnosis, eventually learn to transcend death and live forever. This is pretty wild stuff for a, a you know ex-Jew in the 1780s, 1790s to be talking about. Um, and yet it was recorded in these teachings. Uh, Frank did not live forever. Uh, his movement ended when he died in the 1790s. Uh, his, his daughter carried it on for another 20 years, but it quickly withered. Um, and yet even there, I say and, and talk about in the book, Frank and his movement ended, but he prefigured trends that would later become uh, quite dominant, uh, not just in Judaism, but in Western religion, such as that critique of religious authority, religious law, uh, and some of his other innovations. That is my five minute introduction to Frank. Not my first time doing it, but I hope that that sort of set the stage. Yeah, I was about to say, you must spend a lot of time in elevators talking to people about Jacob <laughs> Frank. So. Well, it's funny, you know, there's uh, uh, he's not well known. I mean, history is written by the victors and he lost. Uh, but it, it's funny that also, you know, at the same time in the same place where Frank was doing his work, uh, the Jewish movement known as Hasidism also arose. And it was just a parallel movement, also spiritual, also ecstatic, also uh, charismatic, centered around charismatic leaders. But uh, Hasidism prevailed uh, and Frankism did not. Yeah. No, I, I also, you know, reading your book where you do talk about some of his teachings and you paraphrase and, and quote from uh, the book, The Sayings of the Lord, which I, I do have a copy of, but I haven't been able to, to read it yet to do the scheduling stuff. You know, I, I, I had this sort of secondhand bad opinion of, of Jacob Frank, right? And I was like, oh, wow, this is actually really cool, or this is kind of insightful, or this this is a, a cool little uh, a parable, or, or also, you know, and then, fortunately, you know, a couple pages later, oh, okay, that's completely insane. That's nuts. That's <laughs> crude. But even even some of the, the nuttier stuff, the, the cruder stuff is is breathtaking. It's interesting. It's fascinating. Um, you know, his his giant phallus that's big enough for children to, to climb on, right, is that line you know, always grabs the attention. <laughs> This is not the first time that that line gets singled out <laughs> in a podcast. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, I mean, you know, it's, it's on the one hand, he has one story, uh, you know, where he goes into a synagogue and like takes the Torah out of the ark and sits on it bare assed and everybody has to leave because the Torah is being disrespected. I don't think this story ever happened. Uh, but just that he tells it is, so this is a crude story, obviously about disrespecting religion. Um, but also, kind of remarkable that this is a story that somebody told to their followers and the followers wrote down uh, as part of a kind of a, a hagiography. I can't think of another, you know, sage telling his story about how, you know, how wonderful I am, which involves, yeah, sitting bare-assed on a Torah scroll. And so even that, which is one of the most vulgar, not the most, but one of the more, most vulgar stories in, in the text, it's remarkable that somebody felt this was how he wanted to present himself. This was this was the figure of rebellion uh, that he wanted to to uh, put out to the world. Yeah. And can you tell us more about the text and, and how it portrays Frank as, as obviously kind of a literary figure, as a literary trickster figure, which is not always accurate to, to who he was, but of course, in some ways, you know, uh, was. <laughs> Right. Yeah. So I, you know, there's a, there's now a, a fantastic 900 page novel about Jacob Frank, right? The Books of Jacob by Olga Tokarczuk, which I mostly love. Um, one thing that I question, I mean, she takes, she's, she is very familiar with the Franca sources. She worked with Pavel Macheco, who's a leading Franca scholar and, and others, I believe. And, you know, she takes those stories as autobiography. Uh, 
Um, and so in her novel, some of the tales from the words of the Lord appear as, you know, she's now, of course, it's a novel. It's a magic realist novel. There's ghosts and spirits. And so it's not like this is bad history. I mean, she's writing a novel. But it does give the sense that those, what I call two Jacob Franks, one the historical figure and the other this literary construction are the same. And, and I don't think that's true. I think these are tales that are often self-contradictory that, you know, are wildly magical, numerous tales about Frank healing the sick and performing miracles and performing feats of uh, superhuman strength. So to me, I mean, I want to look at this as a scholar. I want to look at this as a literary creation. And he's creating this figure, kind of like the, the figure of the holy fool, uh, the person who I'm clearly don't, you know, don't listen to me. I'm just clearly God's chosen person because it's not by my own merits that I'm in this role. Right. So sort of taking authority and disclaiming it at the same time. You know, he depicts himself as uh, we were talking earlier before we started, like about uh, teaching crazy wisdom. You know, these kind of radical, crazy, weird acts. He calls them strange acts, which was taken from Shabtai Tzvi, who also performed uh, strange acts. My favorite of Shabtai Tzvi's was at one point parading a fish, a carp, actually, around in a baby stroller. And it was this whole Kabbalistic symbolism. Uh, but that would look pretty crazy, right? And so Frank depicts himself in that lineage, uh, but perhaps even crazier and definitely more um, bolder and violent and disrespecting authority in a way that Shabtai Tzvi uh, did not present himself in that way. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, I, you know, I, I had more questions about his bio, but you did, you kind of keep brought us through that you know in, in a, which i'm sure more stuff about his biography will come up when we're talking about some of his teachings and you know and, and where they connect and stuff but maybe we can we can just jump into some of his doctrines so you know many have understood his teachings and maybe not looking at at firsthand sources or if they know a little bit about frank as a sort of cabalistic and sabbatean but you write that that western esotericism and gnosticism two things that we talk a, a lot about on this show might be like a a better interpretive lens or at least better parallels you know there, there's not always direct influence so you do talk about how there could be direct influence in the case of western esotericism but can we go through some of his worldview and, and maybe highlight some of these parallels so sure yeah i mean that's that's why I've, i'm happy it was fun to come on this show because i think yeah. you know in most i have done i've talked about the book a fair amount and you know generally it's frank's uh critique that gets talked about more because it's more relatable uh, to more folks, right? So critiquing religious law, why God actually wants you to defy religious law as part of your own, uh, you know, fulfilling your own potential. And, you know, I think that's also, it's also very fascinating. But the stuff you just mentioned gets talked about less. And, and I did, it surprised me because in scholarship, it's barely mentioned. Um, you know, Frank is seen now, and it's certainly true that Frank comes out of a Sabbatean uh, context. He was seen, he was quickly, what was in the words of the Lord was really just intended for his closest disciples. And his larger communities saw him as a successor to Shabtai Tzvi, maybe a reincarnation of Shabtai Tzvi. And he was folded into that Sabbatean framework, you know, as soon as he died, probably while he was still alive, they understood him different from, differently from how he was presenting himself to his closest disciples. So a little bit like we were talking again before, a little bit like there's the outer Scientology and the inner Scientology, and there's there's the doctrine for the inner circle. So this material that we're about to look look at was for the inner circle. And it is a, again, really shocking. And Gershom Sholem, the leading scholar of Kabbalah, did write about this part, that it's when you look at the, the Gnosticism of his teachings, again, that the world was not created by the good God, that there are these three deities who kind of maintain the world. Similar, he doesn't use the term demiurge, but that there are these figures who don't have our best interests at heart. And they're not even really deities in the way that we might. He says at one point that these three mimunim, these three guardians of the world, actually take human form and they wield temporal power, but they are also in charge of kind of all of the terrible things that happen in the world. You know, at the foundation of his worldview is kind of what he sees as an impossibility that a good God would create this world that's filled with disease and death and strife. Um, and it's helpful to just remember, you know, this was like, the Frankist sect was where, and Tkarczyk does this really beautifully in her novel. Um, these are the persecuted part of the persecuted people, right? Yeah. So it's not easy to be a Jew in, you know, Eastern Europe, Central Europe in the 18th century. 
And these were the Jews that the other Jews persecuted, right? These were the these these were the sect within the the people that were being persecuted. And um, one theory, actually, about Francism put forth by a scholar named Hillel Levine was that it's kind of, it was kind of a cargo cult, like a way to get out of it, right? This legitimized conversion to Christianity. Not really sure that's true, but it's just interesting from a sort of social point of view to consider that. So for Frank, this world is incompatible uh, with with the God that he relates to that he does seem to have some communication with he sees himself he does kind of have these prophetic utterances um and so therefore it must be something else uh it must be not the true and so he has this whole conception of this world and and i think maybe here it's more on the esoteric side i don't know if there's a, a clear line between esotericism and gnosticism but more on the esoteric side there is a much larger world which he kind of calls the world behind the screen or the world behind the curtain depending on how you translate it where people do live forever. And there's even a parallel sect to Frank's own sect, uh, headed by a figure he calls the Big Brother, who's kind of his parallel in the other world. And the two sects, Frank's and this otherworldly one, want to meet one another. Um, and they want to connect. It's not quite clear. He, Frank says many times, the Big Brother wants something from me, just like we want something from him. It's not really clear what that is. But certainly from the Big Brother, Frank sect would learn the secrets of immortality. Um, in the 1780s, Frank was also was in direct contact with Western esoteric groups. That's not speculative. Frank actually started uh, their own Masonic lodge, uh, the Society of the a Asiatic Brethren, which was itself kind of marginalized by mainstream uh, uh, Freemasonry, partly because it was admitting Jews or ex-Jews or whatever the Frankists were seen to be. Um, but they were in close contact with these communities. Um, and Frank was doing alchemical experiments in his in his home, in this rented uh, kind of or borrowed castle that he was living in for the last uh, 15 years or so of his life. Um, so he's very much in that context. And yet he he does bring in occasionally Kabbalistic concepts where where that kind of helps him, as we also saw with a lot of other Jewish or ex-Jewish uh, esotericists of the time. Um, Wolf Ibershitz is another one of these who kind of was the son of a suspected Sabbatean, who we now know was a real Sabbatean. Uh, Wolf Ibershitz did convert, and there were these figures who kind of had this mystique of Kabbalah or quote, I'll scare quote the term Oriental, but Oriental mystique, like this exotic appearance. Frank uh, would wear kind of Turkish garb uh, most of the time. And that what's fascinating to me is that this theology, if we want to call it that, or cosmology, kind of synthesis, Frank synthesized this theology out of these multiple different places into something that I found startling uh, when I first came across it. And again, although it's been written about a little bit, it's certainly not what people associate with Jacob Frank. Absolutely. Absolutely. And again, you know, I, I you know, I realize that the, not everybody has my my same obsessions um, and, and just tracing influences is something that I like. And, you know, we were talking about before the show, sometimes there's direct influence. Sometimes there's just parallel thinking and sometimes there's just people are drinking from the same well. So they're going to reach similar conclusions. But, you know, you mentioned the Asiatic brethren and, and Asiatic in this in, in the use of the term in, in this case means something more like Oriental, right? Uh, Eastern. It, it's meant to uh, invoke uh, exoticism. But yeah. it, it was and it's uh, more Semitic, let's say, like it's middle eastern it's not it's not a pretension to like let's say east asia or south asia it's like asiatic in the sense of turkey and and the land of israel and yeah in the middle east precisely that that's what they mean by the term and and as you mentioned it, it was it was sidelined it, it was only around for a little while but it was incredibly influential on on western esotericism you know you don't get later movements like the golden dawn about this this group first um and their materials and some of their teachings are, are used later and they also kind of just distribute um e even among non-members uh, some of these ideas so you know that that is sort of a, a point of contamination <laughs> um maybe that's not the right term for for a lot of these ideas and i find that fascinating but can you talk about um you, you know something that that, that is a big theme of your book and something that that is quite startling and confusing in in jacob frank's thought is that it's 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 this materialistic spirituality um can, can you tell us more about this materialistic world that that's full of magic and powers at the same time Sure. So, you know, this also for me, you know, early on in my research, I mean, I've been doing this a long time, was was a little bit puzzling, actually, until I became more familiar with the Western esoteric material, which has a very similar worldview. So it looks like in a certain way, 
like he's got a foot on each side of this of a divide. So on the one hand, he's got a kind of anti-spiritual materialism. So he says at one point, I don't look to heaven, but at what God does here on earth. And again and again, one of the uh, stories that I, I uh, cite in the book a few times, he goes to a synagogue called the synagogue of the, Pro of the uh, prophet Elijah. And, you know, that's just a name. There's some story that Elijah once, Elijah the prophet once visited, but he demands to see Elijah the prophet. And the person in the synagogue is, well, it's like, well, it doesn't doesn't work that way and he beats up the guy running the synagogue because he says with how can you call yourself the congregation of prophet elijah there's no prophet elijah here that's ridiculous right so there's this literalism hyper literalism materialism like show me show me the money like if it's not if i can't see it it's not real okay and then on the other side of this divide and i'm going to say that there's not actually a divide but it looks like a divide is this radically um mythic conception of the world so Frank's stories in particular, which are really almost without parallel, I think it's one of the, I could, I could have written a whole other book just on the literary quality of these stories, which are, are endlessly surprising and twisted and, and in ways that you really don't expect. Those stories are filled with magical beings, with wizards, with witches, with sorcerers, with magical herbs, with magical rocks, um, with, you know, some of these are actually taken from Jewish folklore. Uh, he has a whole idea that there are these people living in caves who, and he, uh, who are going to help the Frankist sect, and there's a whole myth around them. Um, and and then, of course, the whole myth I just talked about with the big brother and the world behind the screen. So you're kind of like, well, what's going on? Like, on the one hand, you're saying, you know, show me, if I can't see it, it's not true. On the other hand, you're telling me about all of this, like, magical, weird creatures and things like that. But we do see that same juxtaposition in Western esotericism. And I think, for me, you know, so the world, there is what we might think of as magic, but it's real. It's material. It's not... Kind of some vague spiritual promise of another world but there actually are all of these forces and you know that what struck me actually there was one point uh, in a much earlier period in the medieval period um there was there was a rabbinic sage who said that the temple was located where it was in jerusalem not because god chose it or designated it but because it was at a particular an astrologically uh, propitious place just similar to like the idea of like the ley lines, like it was at a it was at a power place basically, and that's why the. So if you think about that for a moment, you know, on the one hand, we might see that I know you and I, but you know, folks today might see that as well, that's superstition or that's magic. But in a certain way, it's actually science, right? It's saying no, this wasn't chosen because some deity in their infinite wisdom chose this spot. There's actually something about this place. And Frank says the same thing about Shanstakhova, which is the kind of national shrine of Poland where Frank was imprisoned, and. I visited Częstochowa. It's still the National Shrine of Poland. There's a painting of the Virgin Mary that is venerated by pilgrims uh, from all over. And it's not venerated as the Virgin Mary. It's venerated as the physical object, the painting itself. Uh, it's painted on, on wood, and it's now been um, uh, gilded in gold and so forth. And so even that, just I think, I don't know if that was the direct influence on Frank, but just that, it's also venerating a physical object with physical magical power whether it's to heal or to defend Poland. And she, this portrait, is imbued with this energy, this power, right? And it's, again, it's not like a kind of immaterial spiritual thing. It's some, some quote-unquote real power. And as I saw that more in Western esotericism, it was like the decoder ring for some of what Frank says. So it's not that the world is just as it appears, you know, and, you know, with uh, flowers and trees. It's the world as it really is with flowers and trees and magical rocks and wizards and forces and other beings and demons and so forth. Uh, but all of those are, in a certain sense, science in that they are they are things, they are creatures, they are beings. And he understands te scriptural text in the same way, uh, the same way that a Western esotericist might read the Bible, you know, finding like, so here's how Solomon did, here's the key of Solomon, here's how Solomon did all this magic, here's Asmodeus, here's Benayahu, here are these figures who, Solomon's not marginal, but who are often marginal in the biblical text who become central with a magical reading of biblical text, and they're central in Frank as well.
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and you even mentioned in, in your book, right? Like, you know, the problem of astrology in some people's eyes is, is not that it was superstition, but that it was too scientific. It, it takes agency away from God. And I think even in high school, people were taught that that alchemy, you know, led to to chemistry. It, it is in, in a weird way. And this is during the Enlightenment. This this esoteric worldview is is strangely materialistic and scientific, like what you're saying. And he's he's imbibing in that. That's his worldview. And it also. Oh, it and I think can I just I just want to build on that for one second you know that i think astrology is a really helpful uh parallel here so i think when people in the 21st century see astrology skeptics certainly see it as you know kind of superstition right the opposite of science but if we really think if we imagined that astrology were, were true right it really is science right it's the things that are happening to you are the are due to material physical things happening in the world in the universe because of the stars so we're recording this right now mercury's in retrograde so like the bad thing that happens has a, it we may in our we may see the superstitious side of that oh it's about mercury that's silly da 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 da, da. but we should also see the scientific side like it's it's offering us a, a, a scientific we may not agree with the science or believe the science, but a scientific type of explanation uh, for things that happen in the world. And that, again, when I sort of got that, both in, in esotericism and in Frank, some of the stuff that seems to make no sense whatsoever starts to make sense. Sorry to interrupt, but I just thought oh, the no, I thought the astrology analogy is really apt because of how we see it, whereas how someone who uh, believes in that worldview might see it, especially you know in the past, a couple hundred years ago. Yeah. You know, I forgot to mention before the show, but this is, you know, sometimes guests, they don't like to interrupt because they're nice like you and they don't like to go on rants. But this is the interrupt and rant show because right. you know, people don't need me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, no, I, I want to go back to what you said about the Asiatic brethren having an influence because that's outside my specialty. Like, I don't know about that. And that's fascinating to me that this what one of the weirdest things, by the way, to do an, to do a tangent about this research was that one of the people who some of the people who get Frankism right are anti-Semites, like are mm. crazy anti-Semites. They're conspiracy theories. So David Icke is the main one of these, right? The mm. the horrible sort of anti-Semitic uh, conspiracy monger from England who thinks that right there are these aliens who are kind of reptilian aliens and their Jews aren't really Jews. But the amazing thing is that he actually seems to get a lot about Frankism correct. <laughs> and there is, right, so one of the great anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, right, the Jewish Masonic plot to start the French Revolution. That's not true, of course. Obviously, I'm not in any way endorsing any anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. I'm a rabbi. But but it, there is a, a tiny, tiny thread of truth to it through the Frankist sect, right? So Frank's leading disciple, who was said to maybe have been groomed to be a successor, uh, Moses de Brushka, did actually play a bit part uh, in the French Revolution and used Masonic the Masonic connections to smuggle arms from the Habsburg Empire to the French revolutionaries, because the Habsburgs wanted to take down France, right? So, and he was executed under the name of Junius Fry, uh, was executed during uh, the Reign of Terror. Um, so there actually is a tiny, t now again, just reiterating, <laughs> this is not the conspiracy theory, but it's remarkable that there some of these kinds of weird little undercurrents, uh, which do have a grain of truth to them. I kept reading, I was like, I couldn't, I don't know where David Icke got his knowledge of Frankism from. And obviously the guy is responsible for horrible violence and terrible ideas in, in the world. Uh, and yet strangely got this partly right. Yeah. Yeah. Which was the, weird. Well, Google, <laughs> Google Gnostics and Gnosticism and you know, oh, yeah, I, yeah, I'm not you get, saying, you, you know, you, right. You get some of the good and some of the not so good. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But yeah, really, for, for the Asiatic brethren, it's well, what's interesting when you talk about some of the um, the, the crossovers uh, uh, between uh, Sabbateanism and uh, uh, Frankism, right? But some of some of the the Frankists uh, are also Sabbateans, and as you as you said, you know, Frank doesn't he, he almost parodies Kabbalah, right? You have a, you have a chapter in that in your book. But it seems that some of the Frankists picked up the Sabbatean Kabbalah and they bring that into the Asiatic brethren, and then that basically becomes the, the Kabbalah. Of of, of later groups of uh, hmm. a group like the Golden Dawn, um, and the, the Golden Dawn's uh, the Kabbalah is deeply Sabbatean, hmm. and uh, you know if you, if you don't get the Golden Dawn, you, you don't get 
tarot, right? You don't get modern tarot and you don't get all the quote unquote Kabbalistic, well, I'll spell it with a Q there. People can't hear the Q when I'm speaking, symbolism that's in tarot, right? And then you don't get Aleister Crowley. And then uh, you, you probably don't even get the Theosophical Society, even though they're at the same time as the Golden Dawn. But, you know, they are drawing on some of the, this older material, right? And what they're calling Kabbalah. So then you don't get the New Age movement. Then you don't get yada, yada, yada. So, you know, it's, it's, it is this match that, uh, that really does spark a huge fire, even if it wasn't that, that big at the time. And when you look at um, sort of uh, the, what, what we'll charmingly call esoteric histories, uh, mythological histories, um, the, in, another name that the Asiatic Brethren used was, was the Knights, Knights of St. John. And there's these legends that, that my community and, you know, I, I say that, that they're legends, even though they, they kind of in some ways reflect the historical flow of ideas in a, in a uh, myth, mythologized way. Um, uh, they, they sort of play an important role uh, with an idea of, of, of underground Joanite Gnostics, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, which, which I don't believe to be historically true, but, but I, I, do, I do think that it is uh, true in a, in a sense that, that is almost literal about how these ideas are sort of sloshing around Europe. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, but moving on, um, the... Uh, uh, a physical, worldly accumulation of power and goods. And, uh, you know, the, you mentioned Cagliostro in, in the book. There's actually a lot of parallels with uh, with Cagliostro and, and Jacob Frank. And, you know, he, he was known for uh, uh, for selling people uh, spells for winning the lottery, uh, mm -hmm. selling uh, 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 the secret to making gold. Uh, so uh, can you tell us a, a bit about how the physical, worldly accumulation of power and goods plays into the thought of Jacob Frank as well as the, uh, the the Western esotericism. Sure. Yeah, it seems so two prefatory things. First, Frank seemed to have mostly a, a different financial model. Uh, he was making his money on contributions from his followers, primarily in Warsaw and in Prague, uh, who continued to kind of support him and through some of his political connections and, you know, sort of an underworld figure. So, but one person, when you mentioned that ab about Cagliostro, I, I thought about the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of Hasidism or legendary founder of Hasidism, who did do that, right? I mean, this was common for, for uh, Jewish sages who were in the magical Kabbalah, if it, if, you know, business, so to speak, uh, selling amulets for protection or for healing or for luck. And uh, so this was a widespread uh, phenomenon. And, um, you know, one that was kind of, in a certain way, marginalized by scholarship, it was seen as, well, that's not the real stuff. The real stuff are these theosophical speculations on the nature of the Godhead. But the Kabbalists and the mystics didn't necessarily see that distinction. And Kabbalah, Masid, practical Kabbalah, was probably the most widely uh, for, widely practiced and widely available. You know, for Frank, one thing that I think is a helpful lens or a way to understand his embrace of the worldly is his retelling of the myth of Jacob and Esau. So in standard kind of rabbinic Judaism, uh, Esau, who founds uh, Edom, is basically a stand-in for Christianity. And so Esau is the stronger brother, the one who has uh, all the power, right, which is certainly how Christianity was relative to Judaism, arguably still today, but certainly, you know, in, in this period. Um, and kind of the, the mean big brother, the bully, in a way. But obviously, Jacob is really the chosen one, right? And Jacob in the text, and I talk about this in some of my LGBTQ-themed writing in the biblical text, he's kind of, the scare quoting here, feminized in a certain way. He's given these attributes of not having this power, right? Physically, right? He has like the high voice and the smooth skin, uh, but he also hangs out in the tents. That's where the women hang out. And it's this whole kind of conception of real, the the true Jewish... Oh, it's a whole, you you good? Know? I, I got hit by Mercury retrograde there. <laughs> yeah, that was definitely the stars. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I'm really sorry. Could you, uh, I'll, I'll edit around this. Could you start at the very beginning of the Jacob and Esau? Very beginning of Jacob and Esau? Okay. Up. Yeah, sorry. Can I do the LGBT part and I'll just do that? Because then I don't do the Christianity or you want the Christianity part also? If you could do the whole. Uh, all right. right, I'll do the whole. Okay, thing. thanks so much. So sure. Um, yeah. Yeah, one helpful way to kind of understand how the accumulation of power and material wealth, which Frank talks about in detail, like in the future, my coaches will be like this and my food will be like that. Uh, one way to understand this is his rereading of the biblical myth of Jacob and Esau. 
So in standard Jewish conception, uh, Jacob, the kind of the younger brother, this is a stand-in for Judaism, and Esau is uh, Edom and stand-in for Christianity and for Rome before that. And so Esau is all material power. Uh, Jacob is spiritual power. Esau is very masculine, whereas in the text, Jacob is kind of, I'll scare quote the word feminine uh, in that he, right, he, he doesn't have the power. He doesn't have the physical strength. Uh, he has a high voice and he stays by the tent and smooth skin. I mean, he's seen as kind of the feminine younger brother who's bullied by the mean older brother. And you can kind of map that. You can see why this was an appealing myth for uh, Jews living under the thumb of Christianity in, in Europe. Um, Frank actually kind of really rereads, radically rereads this whole thing and says that this was actually Jacob's fault for missing that he could have actually really taken on Esau. What we need is to combine Jacob and Esau. And I, Jacob Frank, will be the tikkun, which is like the repair, the, the correction for the biblical Jacob. And Jacob should have seized all of this power. And Frank genders it as well. Frank has a very I would say in anachronistic terms, toxic masculine self-conception, right? His masculinity is not, it's its toxic masculinity, right? Violent and, and aggressive and strong and sexualized and misogynistic. And that for him is part of this new Jewish Christian combination. So for him, all of this accumulation of wealth, and we see similar themes, by the way, in the contemporary Kabbalah Center, where material, it's kind of like the prosperity gospel, like your bearing of material wealth is a sign of your spiritual advancement. They don't see this; these two things as opposed. Never mind that easier to get to get through a camel, get through the eye of the needle than a rich man than driven. No, it's the opposite. It's uh, this material success. For Frank, this is really where uh, where chosenness and success is demonstrated, the material world. And so he has this, and it's kind of a, you know, a self-fulfilling or self-legitimizing ideology, right? It legitimizes his own uh, career and his own exploitation, you could say, of his followers uh, and his own advancement. But it also, and at the same time, right, it's not one or the other, also has this conception of a kind of seizing of power. Uh, in some texts, Frank actually has a triumphalist account, like the Christianity will be overthrown and so forth. In others, and earlier in his career, it would be coexisting uh, with Christian Europe, uh, but with some power and some autonomy. And, you know, again, this was the literature of the persecuted of the persecuted. These were marginalized, mostly impoverished uh, Jews, ex-Jews, uh, living in an incredibly... Uh, it's hard to even say discriminatory. I mean, you know, a horribly discriminatory society and social context. And the idea that there could be a Jewish return to history, return to power, this is what would animate, you know, Zionism 120 years later, that we actually have to, we, we need to get away from this myth of Jacob and Esau and actually uh, seize, you know, gain power for ourselves. That had, so, had its own problematic consequences, but uh, we see that in, in Frank as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, if you could elaborate a bit on this, you mentioned it uh, before, which is a, a striking parallel with Gnosticism. But this world is being ruled by by three malevolent gods, and I, I think maybe a, a point for a parallel with Gnosticism is: is are these gods also ignorant? Do, do they even know about the other world, the the world hmm. behind the screen? You know, that's interesting. I don't think I know the answer to that. I yeah. I can't think of a text where Frank addresses that. Um, oh, sorry to clarify. We don't have a systematic of theology, by the yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, right? no, we yeah. Have, we don't no. have Frank but, writing down. Well, it's interesting. Here's the think, I mean, he talks about that quest in hundreds of of statements. Like that's not it. So it's interesting to think. Like, is that? I mean, it definitely is an escape from their rule, from their domain, and it's not up to them, right? So they have all of these. They're, they're fighting it. Uh, so I guess that means that. I mean, they don't want they don't want the sect to succeed. Whether that they know what it is that the sect is striving for, that's a that's actually a fascinating question. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. And you know, one of the proximate sources, uh, I know we were talking before, you'd had David Halpern on the on on the show. Uh, you know, he's done the best translation and work on uh, on Cardozo, who was a follower of Shabtai Tzvi, who created his own theology. Cardozo was also uh, a converso, meaning he he had, he had been Christian before he was Jewish. And his theology also is somewhat Gnostic. And, you know, implicit in Sabbateanism is a, is a sort of foundational idea that the true world isn't what we're seeing in front of us, right? So for Sabbateanism, the Messiah has come, where actually it's possible to have messianic consciousness uh, in this world and through transgression of the law. 
And that's kind of the real reality. And it's it's this sort of faith that the messianic age is here, despite all evidence to the contrary. Frank does away with that notion of like uh, faith in the unseen. Uh, as you can imagine, he clearly has no real interest in that. But he still does, he maintains this kind of basic grammar, I would say, that the world as we find it is not the ultimate, right? And that there is this, the, with the right, where, where he's very different from the Sabbateans, it's not up to faith in Shabtai Tzvi to get to the ultimate. It's getting that gnosis, which he calls das, the sort of portmanteau or this kind of combination of knowledge, which is the word, Hebrew word da'at or da, da'as in the Ashkenazic pronunciation, and dat, the word for religion, probably, or and maybe even the, the, just the word this, das, uh, in German. But I think mostly we understand, I translate das based on it appearing in 100 or 200 uh, dicta as gnosis. And this is the new, the the new religion that we're really after is the gnosis. And what's the knowledge, the gnosis of? It's this way to the other world. It's knowing the the true structure of reality and using that uh, to transcend death. Yeah, you know, you, you mentioned a, a big brother, but but we didn't really dive into him yet. Can you can you tell us about a big brother? Yeah, it's a complicated figure, partly because it's not systematic. He's not systematized. So uh, I've read there are scholarly texts where like Frank actually talks about God as the big brother. That that definitely doesn't seem to be true. Uh, the big brother is Frank's parallel. There is one text where he talks about this world behind the screen as essentially the world a world of fire, which is so not a material world, but actually sort of it's not clear what's meant by fire exactly, right? But uh, we're gonna, it's going to blend fire and earth. Uh, you know, we're in the earthy world and they're in the fire world, which in a way returns it to me as, as almost like a spiritual conception. So their energy, or I don't know really, he doesn't use the word energy, uh, but uses the word fire. Um, yeah. Al alchemical and, too, right? You're combining earth right. and fire into something new, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And uh so yeah, no, the big the big brother has his followers, just like Frank has his followers, uh, and this is kind of the mirror image just of the closer disciples. Again, this was just was the secret gnosis, uh, just for uh, just for the inner circles. And for me, you know, maybe you could say more about this because to me the parallels to early Mormonism are really striking. Um, there, there is again the sort of sometimes it's physical, sometimes it's not. Like is the are they living, are Mormons living forever in the physical temple, like actually in the temple or, or on other worlds or whatever the, the doctrine is. But, you know, there is this kind, and also the similar thing where there's the inside and the outside. So there's the exoteric doctrine and then the esoteric doctrine. Um, and, you know, I've always, it's always been interesting to me more for Mormon, for, you know, Mormons and for Scientologists, but when the ex, when the esoteric gets discovered, the different ways of relating to it. So maybe drive it further underground or try to sanitize it in some way or to say, yeah, this is our esoteric doctrine. You also believe some crazy things, you know, here's like, there are lots of different strategies of this revelation of, of the esoteric. And it's definitely not you know, the Frankist text was eventually circulated to some of the wider followers in Warsaw. It does seem that they censored some of it and uh, suppressed some of it. In fact, you know, we haven't talked too much about uh, sexual practice, but we don't really know the extent to which sexual ritual was practiced in the sect. It was definitely practiced to a very limited extent, but it may have been in, the, in sort of popular imagination, you know, it was like sex orgies all the time. There's no evidence of that. But on the other hand, maybe the evidence was suppressed, right, by followers a hundred years later who were scandalized by it. I don't know if we'll ever know the the answer to that question. But you know, for me, this doctrine, the doctrine of the Big Brother, was part of this small esoteric doctrine that I don't know was ever intended uh, to be circulated just to the wider Frankist community, let alone to the rest of us. But I've always been struck by the you know, the esotericism to Mormonism. And, you know, there's the, the book, The Refiner's Fire is about, there's a lot of really great books on the sort of Gnostic esoteric uh, Latter-day Saints connection. Um, maybe you want to say more about that because I, I, I could learn from you on that. Well, you know, I, I think most of it is in your book because you do make the parallel at some point, I think just in passing. But when I was reading the book, Weirdly, I was like... filed my book under Mormonism, by the way. Oh, no. So for a brief time, the algorithm, I don't know, it must have just picked up the word or something. It was definitely not, you know, when we filled out the forum, when Oxford uh, Press filled out the forum, it didn't, I'm sure that wasn't in there. So for a while, I had the hundredth best-selling book on Mormonism <laughs> on Amazon. <laughs> but, but, but that's just it. I, I think maybe you mentioned this also in passing in your book 
book, it's it's drinking, even though you know Joseph Smith is later, right? He he is involved with esoteric Freemasonry, and he's picking up these these second, third hand esoteric ideas, Western esotericism, and Gnostic ideas, and he's putting his own spin on them. And uh, it it is interesting that that he reaches these these similar parallels with Frankism, with this this very um, uh, embodied physical um, uh, mix, right? Now, I, I, besides that, I can't say much more on it. Um, uh, but I think what it is, is it is this, you know, I, I do think Western es esotericism does spread around. It's not always Gnostic, but but there are Gnostic uh, streams within it, Gnostic themes. I think some of these Gnostic streams and themes are very ancient. But here we have sort of a combination of this focus on the here and now, the material world, which you've been discussing, which keeps popping up in Western esotericism, which may or may not be in co contrast to Gnostic themes, but both are being carried by the uh, by the same stream. Does that make sense? So it makes sense that if you're getting it from the same point of contact, that you're going to try to combine them, even if they're strangely at odds, or if not at odds, there's a tension there. But they they're they're, they're both are they're two letters arriving in the same envelope. Mm -hmm. um, and I think people like like uh, like Frank and Joseph Smith are are opening up the envelope and uh, uh, taping the two letters together. Does that make any sense at all? Yeah, I love that. I'm gonna yeah. steal that. Okay, um, please. Yeah, no, I think that's a great. That's just a really good. And, and you know, one of the one of the side points of that is when you see those two letters together, and you it gives rise to a, an inference that there's that envelope. Right. So it's like, well, that's strange. We see this combination of two kind of contradictory doctrines. Well, that's well, we also see that exact same combination, you know, or if not exact same, a similar combination, you know, in these other currents, uh, you know, going back hundreds of years. So I think, yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, that's that. Even though I think there is that tension there, I think the the idea that the Gnosticism is, is you know about hating the body, wanting to get out of this world is is not necessarily true, right? And a lot of scholars have been doing work on this, and and I think there's been lots of streams of Gnosticism going back to uh, very ancient streams that that are strangely very focused on this world. You know, my personal interpretation is is that you know the world is broken, everything is broken. You know, learn how to live with that, right? Uh, there's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets through, but you know, there's uh, there's some work on the Carpo Creations that perhaps that they were trying to build uh, Plato's Republic, that they are mm. literally reading the Republic and trying to establish it on Earth. Maybe mm. with this understanding that you know uh, things things are a little bit messed up, but let's 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 try to do our part. So that that said, I still think that there, there is there is this tension that I'm talking about. But even so that Plato's even implicit talking. in Pla that tension is even in Plato. In Plato right? yeah, so exactly. on the one hand, right yeah. there's here's how to build the Republic in this yeah. world. On the other hand, right the metaphor of the cave. So yeah. you know everything we're seeing is just the surface level of the and and yeah no i think that's really evocative right i mean there's no you know there's no such thing as gnosticism everywhere right there's lots of different streams and and so and especially when it's in a soup you know a western esoteric soup right so there's some from this stream and some from that stream and and they harmonize or they don't but um it's certain yeah that, that so I, yeah that that makes sense to me yeah. And and also, you know, Gnosticism and some scholars say, well, there was never a, a, any ancient Gnosticism. It's a, it's a creation of a heresy hunters, which which I don't agree with. But the term is slippery, right? And my my newest definition for the term Gnosticism is it's whatever I say it is. Um, and it's something that, that at least for me is a, is a Gnostic theme uh, that is that is kind of in Frank is it's, it's very mysterious, even confusing who God is, because Big Brother may or may not be God or sometimes is God, but really isn't a true God. Right, and it's not the three gods that rule this earth, right? And and you mentioned that sort of the biblical god is um is a, a shed. Is is that how you say it? Yeah. So one of the names for so you know the Bible has many names for God. Uh, one of them is Shaddai, mm -hmm. which actually etymologically is probably uh, connected to breasts. It's actually possibly a, a bit of the divine feminine kind of filtered into biblical theology, which is very provocative to think about. But for uh for Frank, he says Shaddai is a shed. Shed is the word for demon. Mm -hmm. So actually one of the times that, so there, Shaddai speaks many times, you know, the traditional Jewish uh, explanation, Shaddai is just another name for God. So yod heh -Vav -Heh, Elohim, Shaddai, these all refer to the same, the same deity. Uh, but Frank says Shaddai is actually a shed, is actually a demon. So, you know, you could go back and like pick like a biblical scholar does, you know, because the, the biblical scholar, scholarly view is that these do represent different traditions that were then stitched together in the Bible. But uh, that's not Frank's view, but he has a similar kind of, uh, 
methodology in a certain way. You could go back and wherever Shaddai is speaking, you know, for Frank, that's the that's the demon. On the other hand, you know, Frank, I think, is is very clear. He does have, and you know, this is not original to him by any means, a certain skepticism about like the record of the Bible is not a record of what really happened. Something really happened uh, for Frank, right? There is this magic. So for like the Queen of Sheba, for example, you know, is one of his heroes, as for many magic folks in Western esotericism. So the way she's depicted in the Bible for Frank is like a very partial figure of the real what he sees as the reality or what he teaches anyway is the reality of of her power and her existence. And Solomon only kind of gets his power from her uh, in the Frankist version of the myth. And so that and that ties into his whole he has a conception of a sort of recurring divine feminine figure called the maiden, who's actually the Messiah and whose kind of sensuality and power incarnate in in the, in a feminine figure. And so for Frank, there's this um, rereading of the Bible through a very, I would, you know, an esotericist lens, but also a kind of skeptical lens. Like you're only getting one version of the story here. And actually the real story is, is much more complicated and has to do with all of the themes we've been discussing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you tell us, I'm not going to be able to say this right, but the, the mysterious sages, the, the, ba, the Balai Kaben? Uh, Balai Kaben, yeah. Balai mm -hmm. Kaben. Yeah. So, them. yeah, this is, again, one of those things that I, when I first came across it. So there is, and, and I talk about this in the book, there is kind of a, a longstanding legend that derives itself even from the Talmudic period and from legendary material from there that begins actually about whether you can carry a prosthesis on the Sabbath, believe it or not. That's like the, and so then from that develops a, a, a Jewish folkloric legend about these people who have these, they can carry, you're allowed to carry your prosthetic limb on the Sabbath. That's a Jewish legal point because normally you're not allowed to carry things on the Sabbath. Um, and then there becomes this whole legend about these people, like a whole, that's not just one person with a prosthesis it's a whole group of people and they become these kind of magic figures in Frank, they're almost like kind of a little bit like how Icelandic people see the elves right so like they are real they are not elves in Iceland if you've I don't know if you've had Icelandic elf folks on the show but they are not magical lucky charms beings these are people they don't they they would like to be left alone thank you very much you know they live in in certain places uh the Bali Kaban are kind of similar for Frank that's this um quasi-magical uh, beings. It's not just people who have prosthesis, but they actually have, they can kind of fly and they have magical power. They have a lot of gold and they're, they're going to come at one point, they'll come to the aid uh, of the Frankist community when the, when, you know, when the good stuff happens, uh, whether it's the war or, or, or the ascension to power. And here again, you know, it's this combination of, so using some Jewish materials, totally rereading them into a different, into a different mythic form. Um, but yeah, there would be this this kind of um, and but he says, you know, the cave is right there in Shostakova. It's not like some in some magical other world. So again, a, a kind of fascinating combination of materialism and myth. Yeah, um, immortality and the construction of a soul as an alchemical process, which which has a lot of parallels with with Western esoteric thought. But can you like, uh, for instance, uh, you mentioned Cagliostro. We've mentioned him. Um, you even mentioned his uh, Egyptian Freemasonry. Well, the, his Egyptian Freemasonic system ends with an alchemical working that, that basically restores your body, makes you young again. And he sort of hints that, that this process gives you some kind of immortality. And it starts off as a physical uh, process, right? You, you are made young again. So are you, are you then young and immortal forever? It's a little bit unclear. Or does this kind of create a, a soul body for you that, that, that will allow you to continue on after death? It's, it's, it's not quite, it's, it's not quite clear from the materials, but uh, can you tell us about the, the sort of Frank's take on this? Yeah, also not clear, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it, I don't think he bothered to work it out. And there is a, there is a point, I think, where he says we will get new bodies, um, there's one text in that, you know, he has in one chapter of the book, I, I tried to kind of, and I may have over schematized it to try to map out the stages of this transformation. Uh, so the first stages have been accomplished, right? So, you know, what really happened in history, the sect converted and, and they, the sect thought before conversion, they were petitioning to get an autonomous region of Poland where they could be separate basically from the rabbis and from the, the Polish authorities as well. That didn't work out. Then the, the scandal happened, the conversion happened, that didn't work out. Frank was actually thrown in jail. So, you know, the thought might have been, great, we've now converted to Christianity. We're going to be Christians and get rich, right? Uh, but instead, since this, these things didn't work out, Frank later, you know, now we're 25 years later, works out this post hoc 
rationalization for the conversion. So the real reason this happened was to get us closer to Edom Christianity, and that was on the way to get us to Das, to Gnosis. And from the Das, there would be a number of transformations that would take place. Ruling over animals is one of them. I'm curious if that actually shows up in any of the other materials. Uh, gaining new clothes, like some sort of magical attire that may have something to do with magical attire from the Bible, or may even just be the Polish national attire that people wore, nobility wore. We'll gain this magical attire. We'll then liberate the maiden, who I mentioned before. She's going to be the gateway to the other world. And from the other world, we will then have these new souls and or new bodies uh, and, and live forever. And, and yet that coexists with the material versions of his predictions of the future, uh, which some of them just look like the world will continue as it is, but we will have this power. So we'll be kind of the uber secret society. Uh, where we, whether it's that's post immortality or not, is not clear, it's not developed, and I think it's probably just contradictory. You know, they're in different places in the text, so it might just be a different myth that he's telling. You know, for me, the sort of prophecies of the future part are the least interesting things that Frank says and the most conventional. Um, after he dies, his disciples circulate a text allegedly written by Frank, but actually very different from anything he'd, he'd ever said in his life, dense with prophetic allusions and references, you know, saying there's about to be an apocalyptic war very soon, like next year, and uh, everybody's going to die, but the, you know, some, uh, the, the ma'aminim, the believers, the true believers of, uh, from the Jews will, will survive. You know, look, I mean, as a scholar, that's part of the teaching. I'm not going to just pretend it's not there because I don't find it interesting, but it's probably the least innovative. Um, and it's really li literally, you know, the end of the world is nigh. Uh, Frank will come back or is still alive or something like that, you know, similar to every uh, most false messiahs who die. Uh, and we'll, we're going to win. Uh, we're going to win in the end. So it's a vague, anytime he's talking about the future, you know, I think in the esoteric side, that it's a little more interesting uh, and less conventional, but it's still not uh, particularly well defined. Yeah. So I, I think another parallel with Gnosticism that that people have been noticing from from a figure that you're mentioning is is the maiden, and and I know that she's a, a rather complicated figure uh, with Frank. Uh, but can you tell us about her uh, and what she has to do with the Shekinah, the Shekinah, what she has to do with sexual uh, antinomianism, uh, what she has to do with this this painting of the Virgin that you mentioned, and what she has to do with the Messiah, and what she has to do with Eve Frank, uh, the Jacob Frank's daughter. So she is the Messiah. Um, Frank is often described as a false Messiah, but he never actually set himself out in that in those terms. There is a Jewish concept of the Messiah, the son of Joseph, and the Messiah, the son of David. So the Messiah, the son of David, is the real Messiah, but the first one will announce, kind of a John the Baptist figure, actually, uh, will announce the coming of the true Messiah. In a way, Frank is that role, but he never actually makes use of those images, uh, those, those particular references. Uh, so the maiden, you know, it... it it's tricky for scholars because like you keep like picking among the different. So, I mean, I, I cataloged every single dictum in which she is mentioned and tried to put them together in a way that did justice to the, to the sources. Uh, long story short, she seems to be a kind of perennial figure who incarnates over and over again in, in humans or takes like an, a human avatar, you could say. That's also, that's not in the text. That's me putting that in maybe because I just saw the movie. Uh, but, um, she is so she's Queen Esther. She, uh, you know, who kind of uses, if you think about what Queen Esther does, if for folks not familiar with that story, you know, she pretends to be uh, Persian, right? She marries the, marries the king. She uses sexuality to advance her way, right? Her beauty and then actual sexuality with, with the king, um, ultimately for this purpose of saving uh, the Jewish people. So there again, that's kind of, she is Queen Esther is a sexual antinomian. That's not how I was taught the Purim story in Sunday school, but she is, right? She's transgressing yeah. you can't do that <laughs> you're not allowed to marry a gentile king and like you know have sex with him and right and that's not how it's supposed to go but that's kind of glossed over in the story you know the, what's what the focused on is her heroism of course right that she stands up and saves the jews but uh for frank she's this transgressive hero and she's a model of uh using transgression but sexual transgression in particular uh to bring about the redemption and so it seems certain that Frank thought that the maiden was incarnated in the black version of Sean uh, And that would explain why, you know, her role as this kind of savior figure and protector figure, but also uh, in Frank's daughter, Eve, uh, 
who did become the leader of the sect afterwards, but before when Frank was still alive, was sort of venerated as potentially the Messiah incarnate. And here again, you know, it's not quite clear was the idea that Eve would become kind of the queen. Eve herself, by the way, had a sort of a Queen Esther moment where she had an affair with Joseph II of, uh, of Austria. Uh, and there again was very kind of similar in a way, like Frank played the role of Mordechai, Esther's uncle or protector, whatever he was, and kind of you know, we don't have, we do have Eve's voice in the text. There are a number of dicta which are are set, are stated by Eve, including recounting of her own dreams. You know, it's always in these things, uh, certainly from a 21st century perspective, you know, what the consent level was, or it's it's obviously extremely problematic. Uh, but this did happen apparently, and and the affair was real until it, until it went sour. Um, so this maiden figure, is kind of representative of this sexual liberation that would be a hallmark of the Messianic age. That was taken not just from Sabbatean Kabbalah, but even from Zohara Kabbalah and Luriana Kabbalah, that in the Messianic age, uh, the rules of the Torah of this world would no longer apply. Uh, and there'd be a different Torah that would govern that, that age. And that is a fundamental antinomian conception. Antinomian just means against the concept of the nomos or the law. Uh, that's within uh, mystical Judaism as well, not just within heretical mystical Judaism. Uh, it gets amplified. And the Dernma did engage in, in some limited choreographed sexual rituals uh, as a way of enacting that mess the messianic age. And again, now we're talking, uh, you know, 17th as well as 18th century, and and that continued apparently through at least the 19th and probably into the 20th century, where there would be, if not some some kind of group sexual activity, uh, ritualized on a particular particular day of the year. So again, like. Orgies are great, nothing against orgies, but these weren't quite them. It was not a sort of free for all. It was a it was a ritual. Um, and again, you know, we certainly see that obviously in Crowley, but also in other forms of later Western esotericism, this um, notion that the sexual act for, for Sabbatism is a little bit different from how I understand it in, in later magic. It's not necessarily that that act generates power, uh, but it inculcates this messianic consciousness. Um, and, you know, for me, and here I get a little bit on my more skeptical side toward the uh, toward the end of the book, you know, I want to kind of take that seriously. I mean, the idea to me, this is actually the birth of what we now, what is now the dominant strain in Jewish spirituality. So the Hasidim took the same notion. They just sublimated the eroticism to erotic prayer with the Shekhinah, with the divine presence. And so it, there are all these mainstream Hasidic texts, which you should understand men should pray as if they're having sex with the, with the Shekhinah. And that creates spiritual consciousness. That creates this closeness, this expanded mind, this, this cleaving to the divine. That, in a more tame way, is what's commonplace in spirituality. So you get into a kind of ecstatic experience, and that experience brings you closer to God. But if we, you know, if we look historically in the lineage, this is the lineage of that experience. And so, it this it's sexuality with the incarnate Shekhinah, with the incarnate divine feminine, confirms and actualizes the messianic consciousness. Yeah. You know, I wonder, and it's something I've I've been wanting to research. But you know, esotericists love to make uh, connections. They're not always uh, helpful or accurate. More charts, but, more charts. Yes, yes, more charts. Yeah. Um, but uh, at, at the end of the the nineteenth century, uh, a variety, a large variety of esotericists, including uh, Gnostics. So the Gnostic Church uh, is established in eighteen ninety. Comes out of the the French occult uh, revival. Uh, we're we're expecting an incarnated uh, female messiah. Hmm. Uh, to sort of herald in the, the 20th century. And, you know, I, we're talking almost 100 years earlier with, with Eve Frank, but, you know, I, I wonder if, if that was, a, if she was an influence on this thought because the Frankists are mixing with this earlier material, uh, these earlier groups, this earlier stream that becomes such a big influence uh, at the end uh, of the of the 1800s. So just just a connection, something I've been thinking about, something I want to research it to see if it's, uh, if, if it's more solid. Uh, but, uh, yeah. It's fascinating to think about that. You know, so... The where there is a more mainstream Kabbalistic thread here with the female Messiah is that the Messiah would incarnate would in the in the system of the Sfirot, the Messiah is the Shekhinah, is the manifestation, the divine presence. So for Shabtai Tzvi, who was male, um, he actually has a very complicated gender identity. And I don't want to get like two projecting back concepts of gender from our century to theirs, but 
it is the case like he was seen as having a female soul essentially or maybe being not quite a biological woman anatomically in the body of a man but having feminine attributes there are also a number of erotic and homoerotic hymns that are sung by male disciples about the beauty of Shabtai Tzvi. Um, and that's seen as that scene is not quite homoerotic because it's the beauty of the Shekhinah incarnate in Shabtai Tzvi. Of course, for me, I mean, I do a lot of it. Like I said, I do some queer theological work. Of course, that's homoerotic. That's completely fascinating that there is this complicated bi-gendered figure, again, not using trans language from our century, but that there is this complicatedly gendered figure uh, who is the Messiah. And part of that is because the Messiah is, is uh, the Shekhinah, is Malchut, the divine, the kingship, queenship of the divine on earth. I was unaware of that uh, until this conversation, that there's a notion of a female Messiah ushering in the 20th century. That to me is co totally fascinating and definitely worthy of study. There's actually a really good brand new article um, co-authored by Boaz Hus, and I'm forgetting my colleague who co-authored it with him, called A Prolegomenon to the Study of Jewish es Esotericism, mm -hmm. which I would put that right on the top of your list. Maybe have Boaz uh, and and uh, my, my friend on, on the show too. You know, there is, there's now a group of scholars who are, you know, earlier on, and, and this goes in Sholem as well, like, you know, Eliphas Levy and all these guys from the 19th century quasi-Jewish figures were really marginalized in scholarship. It's like, well, this is nonsense. They're just like, this isn't real Kabbalah. They're taking some from here and taking some from there. And, you know, that really just reflects the bias of scholars more than anything else as to, you know, what religions are deemed or what 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 production of esoteric thought is deemed worthy of study. It is now understood as being worthy of study, and this would be this could be somebody's great dissertation. Uh, you know, uncovering what are the sources of the female Messiah, since whether it's from Frank specifically, or from Sabbateanism, or from Kabbalah more broadly, um, that is a fascinating doctrinal migration. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll definitely want to uh, do that show uh, once you remember the the other person's name. I'll we'll send be it in to touch. you absolutely, and I'll definitely look for that article too. But I guess, unfortunately, you know, uh, we do have to start wrapping up. So, uh, a, a question that that I think is is a great uh, place to end is: Does he matter for the twenty first century? Yeah. So I, I, it's an interesting question. I think my answer to you would be different from my answer to most, to most people. You know, I think for folks who are deriving spiritual or inter intellectual sustenance from these streams, I think he is a fascinating figure. And some of what we've talked about, you know, whether he is personally, you know, of spiritual value, you know, I think is a question. I do think, you know, I'm itching for someone, you know, with more esoteric knowledge. I mean, I did a deep dive, you know, to do the dissertation on which the book was based, but, you know, it's still compared to, you know, Walter Hanegraaff or people like that who really, you know, really, really know this stuff, you know, to uncover some of those themes in the Frankist tales, I think is, is, uh, would be fascinating. And, you know, every so, you know, all these tales, like I said earlier, the, so you, you know, you have the translation, you read them and you're kind of like, where I've, you know, it's stuff that we just don't see anywhere else. Sidebar, by the way, the one place that we do see it is a Hasidic master named Rabbi Nachman of Braslov, who's widely renowned for his tales, one of which he appears to have plagiarized from Jacob Frank uh, and made some differences as well. Uh, the tale of sort of the rooster prince, and it's a it's a, a figure who goes mad and thinks he's a rooster and the sage is able to cure him. And um, that's the very short version. Uh, so there are those points of direct influence. So I think for people, for folks, esoterically minded and Gnostically minded folks, I think this is a fascinating intersection uh, to, to study and possibly, uh, enriching as well. You know, for folks, you know, I, I talk about this a lot in Jewish studies, you know, in a certain way, Frank was a dead end and Sholem saw him, Gershom Sholem saw him as like the dead end of the Sabbatean movement. Um, true and not true. You know, there's a way in which Frank does prefigure a lot of contemporary spiritual concerns, All right? So what did Frank say? Like you can do away with a lot of Jewish law and maybe you should because it's holding you back from your potential, but there is a spirituality that's available to you that's grounded in the in those uh, symbols and myths and traditions. I mean, that's what like 90% of <laughs> practicing Jews think today, right? Any non-Orthodox Jew has that view, right? That that the law and the Torah may not be what this what traditional Jews say it is, but that there is, you know, that there is a there is treasure in that shipwreck, uh, and that there's something of value that's still there. Um, 
you know, the, the notion that, that sexual liberation is not a bad thing, but is a, is a, a good thing. Obviously that's something that's shared by lots of people, even though, again, as I've said before, we, we certainly wouldn't want Frank's coercive uh, behavior imported into anything, uh, in a contemporary way. So, you know, I think, I think there, for me, I didn't set out to reclaim Jacob Frank. And I've said many times that he's, he's, he has, uh, he's canceled <laughs> there's no there's you know there's no rescue there's there's no attempt to rescue him uh and and yet there's something incredibly fascinating and perhaps inspiring that, of the limitless bounds of his uh theological creativity that for me that is inspiring um that in a in in this period in the 1750s there was there was someone who saw things that other people wouldn't see for another 100 or 150 years um and created for all of his uh, irredeemable faults uh created a worldview that still surprises me i mean i feel like i could open up the text now and find something that had i'd read once but forgot about and still surprises me every day that i that i turn to it absolutely the name of the book is The Heresy of Jacob Frank, From Jewish Messianism to Esoteric Myth, and uh, jmichelson.net. Uh, Jay Michelson, thanks so much for joining us. Absolutely, Bye. a real pleasure.